Hello, everybody. Um, I am Martha Seelman. I am the executive director of Studio Art Quilt Associates, otherwise known by our acronym SAQA or SAQA. Um, you've just been watching a slideshow of the art that is in an exhibition called Beyond the Mirror. It was originally scheduled to be premiered at the International Quilt Festival in Houston. Of course, that had to be canceled. However, the virtual quilt festival starts tomorrow. And this is one of the two Sakwa exhibitions that will be part of the virtual quilt festival. The other virtual exhibition is Ebb and Flow. This exhibition that we're going to be talking about today, Beyond the Mirror, will have a physical uh, exhibition provided that the museum is able to open at the Loveland Museum in Loveland, Colorado from January 23rd to May 9th. So if it's safe, I hope that people who are in that area will get to see these quilts in person because no matter how wonderful it is to be able to see things on a website or through Zoom, nothing compares with being able to see the artwork in person and to really be able to study the stitching and the colors and et cetera. Um, I want to just um, take a few minutes to uh, tell you about SAQA and um, to just uh, give you some updates about text, the Textile Talks program. So uh, Textile Talks is a series of lectures put on by six organizations of which SAQA is one. SAQA is a membership organization of people who are interested in and passionate about art quilts. And um, we invite everybody to consider joining us. Right now we're running a special uh, for new members. If you join bet between now and the end of the year and you use the discount code of NEW20, NEW20, you can get $20 off of the member, regular membership price. Um, and we encourage you to join. Um, we offer a lot of benefits to our members in terms of various kinds of education and networking, as well as an annual conference, a quarterly journal, and lots of other resources. Everybody is invited to visit our website saqa.com, where we have almost 4,000 art quilts. Just look for art, browse the collection, and really have fun looking at all the different kinds of art that our members create. Textile Talks, which is this ongoing series, um, will be on vacation um, on December 23rd and December 30th so that everybody can enjoy the holidays. Um, so we will have textile talks for the next two weeks um, and you'll get email reminders, but then we will be on vacation the 23rd and 30th and then starting up again on January 6th and we have some really exciting programming planned for 2021 and we hope that you will continue to join us each week on Wednesday. Um, finally, <clears throat> I wanted to mention that because it's the end of the year in the United States, this is a time when nonprofits ask for support and all six of the organizations are running um, appeals right now. Your support for any and all of these organizations is what allows us to be able to provide the kinds of exhibitions and programming that you really enjoy. And so please think about whether you can support one or more of the different organizations um, as we raise funds to be able to support what we do in the coming year. Finally, um, I would like to thank our sponsors, they allow us to be able to pay 
for a Zoom account large enough to accommodate everybody. And by my count, we're right around 500 people right now, as well as the other services that are necessary to put on the textile talks. So we are really grateful that these companies are underwriting the textile talk programming. And we hope that you enjoy this textile talk itself. So today, we are going to meet four of the artists from Beyond the Mirror, Bobby Bao, Al Krieger, Fuzzy Mall, and Catherine Wilson. They're each going to spend um, somewhere between five and 10 minutes telling you about their work, telling you about their studio practice. And what I would like you to do as you're watching their presentations is to put your questions for them in the Q&A box. I'll be monitoring that all during the presentations. And then I will be interviewing the four artists um, and asking them your questions. We'll try to get through as many questions as we can. Um, and I've seen a preview of their presentations and they're all really different. They're all really fascinating. And I know you're gonna love it. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce you to Bobby Bao, who will start with her presentation. Hi, everybody. Um, first off, have to give thanks to Lucy and Martha and all of the staff at SACWA for doing such a great job helping us prepare and for making textile talks possible. It's really an honor. I thank you very much. Um, let's see the picture of my quilt, please. This is Becoming One with the Night. It's the work that I have in Beyond the Mirror. This is a work that shows two realities at once. We have a foreground of a young woman on a porch and we have a background that could be how she feels, where she is, what her experiences have been. It's a way to show two realities at once and to show beyond the surface of her. Uh, so I have some pictures about how this was made, but I want to go back in time for a minute first and uh, talk about how I got to this point. Uh, next, please. This is my very first art quilt. I made it in around 2010. It's about eight inches by 10 inches. You see on the right there, it has a place of honor uh, above my working junk in my studio, and it's right next to my head in my Zoom picture. I don't show this because I think it's a great work, but because it was very important to me and for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is the way that I constructed it. At the time when I was in this textile group, I was really just learning about fabrics and how to work with them. I had never been a quilter before. So not knowing what else to do, I collaged this as the way to put it together. I had done some mixed media and some collage work, so I was comfortable with that. And that has stayed part of my practice, though I've changed a lot about how I work. Putting things together as collage was something that started then and that has not changed. Uh, second thing, which is really the more important one, is that this, this little work just had a, a gut punch experience to me when I looked at it. And the reason is I, I had never done work that was a self-portrait, I had never done work that was really about anything. I'd done still lifes and landscapes and pictures and, you know, but nothing that had a story. And in this one, I actually buried a story in the surface itself. Uh, that text that you see in the body and in the foreground, uh, I typed out some words that told the story about my name. Uh, my given name is Barbara. I changed it to Bobby when I was in elementary school. It was a big deal. It was kind of an act of defiance and sort of stating who I am. And I have stayed Bobby ever since. So to me, looking at that work really meant something. And it just turned on a light in my head. And I said, oh, I can use collage, quilting, and textiles to tell stories, things that are internal and meaningful. And that was a really important thing to experience. And that has stayed part of my practice as I focused on my main body of work about the journey and in particular a girl's journey. Next please. So now we're back to um, becoming one with the night. 
And on the left, that's where I have started to rough out the picture. Uh, I had a photograph that I started with. Um, my next door neighbor, a lovely young woman came over and modeled for me. She sat on the porch and then I took that photo, I manipulated it, I simplified it. And then the way I chose to enlarge it for this one was by drawing by hand with a grid system. So that was gonna give me my template. Next. And so now I've started to put the image on the fabric. Uh, I've traced it from that piece of paper onto muslin. All of my image making is with acrylic paints. Uh, that's the big change from that first little um, collage that I made. Those were purchased fabrics. I don't purchase any commercial fabrics anymore. I only use uh, plain muslin and sheer polyester and acrylic paints. And they will go on in varying degrees of thickness and applied in different ways. This was the one place where I wanted to be the darkest. I wanted a really good pop kind of dark background behind her head. And so I painted it on. Next. This shows the under layer of the quilt. You can see that that section that's the right two thirds of the quilt ended up having a forest uh, tree filled kind of image. It didn't start that way. It started as a lot of individual squares and each one of those squares is collaged and composed. And those pieces are primarily monoprints on different kinds of fabric. Uh, all I knew in advance is that I wanted the girl to be in the foreground and I wanted some sort of blue mood behind her. I really didn't know how it was going to progress, but this is how I started. Next. Uh, this is sewing the piece and I included this to show the machine that I work on. I just have a little small machine like you would use for garment making. Uh, I use this for all of my construction and for all of my quilting. And so that means I have to learn how to design and how to compose so that I can quilt as I go and so that I can work in small enough pieces that I can get them through the little throat of the machine. Uh, when you collage, your fabric gets pretty stiff. And so I couldn't get a great big piece through there. And so I like to think of that not as a limitation, that's a design challenge, you know, how to make it interesting to put something together in a way that I can actually make it. Uh, next, please. So now we're going to look at a few other pieces. I made this one a few years before becoming one with the night. This is the flight of the magical lawn chair. Um, and it shows uh, all the ones we're going to look at have the images of the girls in some kind of scene. And in this case, I chose to do the girls just as a silhouette. Uh, they are cut out of painted muslin and then uh, collaged and then stitched onto the background. That's from a photo of my sister and myself when we were little. I'm the one on my left with my little feet sticking out. And as you might guess, we never really did get on a magic lawn chair and fly away into the night. But I liked to imagine how everything about our life would have been different if, if we did. And what an adventure that would have been. Next, please. This is neither here nor there. Uh, I made this probably about in between the lawn chair and becoming one with the night. Uh, it's my same model, my next door neighbor, again, although in this piece, even when I depict the figure in a more realistic way than the silhouettes on the little girls in the lawn chair, I want her to be universal. So I just do the barest suge suggestion of features so that it could really could be any young woman and even her age is ambiguous. She might be 10, she might be a teenager. You can insert your own story in there. And uh, another motif that I use a lot is this image of the ladder back chair. It implies a memory place for me. And so she's just in between one stage and the next. Next, please. This is a more recent work. This is overlooked. Uh, again, I've drawn the figure directly. She is even more universal. I gave her no facial features. Um, one thing that's new in this piece is the incorporation of the photo transfer. I use that a good deal now. Uh, I like to do my own photo transfers. I think they pop really nicely. And the inspiration for this was the windows. They were tossed aside in my sister's yard and overgrown and overlooked. 
and they seem to me to be a very beautiful metaphor for a little girl who maybe also feels like she's being overlooked and not getting much attention in her garden. Next. From the place where we landed is another way to envision a girl on a journey. Um, as is frequent in my work, this is more metaphorical than real. I don't, it's not about a real tree going through a real house. It's just something she's been through and she's landed and now she's looking back. Uh, she's also, I think her pose and her head tilt allows you to put your own story in there as to how she's doing or how old she is or how, you know, exactly what this experience is that she's been through. It gives you a lot to look at and wonder what the story is there. Next. This is Look Through to the Memory. It's uh, the most recent work that I've done. I'm very grateful that this is right now in uh, the Visions Art Museum in uh, San Diego, virtually in uh, their Visions 2020 show. Uh, this has some of the same characteristics that we've seen. Uh, their layers are built up through collage. There is a photo transfer there. The window is photo transferred and also the water that you see down in one of the panes is a photo transfer. The rest of it is all various kinds of image making with acrylic paints. Um, some of the parts that look heavier, like the lower left quadrant uh, is heavier. That's an opaque um, muslin fabric. The parts that look more ethereal or transparent actually are transparent fabric. And when I print in a loose or lighter way on the transparent fabric, uh, it has that ethereal look. This is really about the little girl, but she's not the first thing you see. You might have to look around for a while before you see her there seated atop the window. Next frame, please. And there's a close up. And again, I've chosen a different way of depicting her. I did some drawing with a marker and pencils here to create her form. And again, it's she's in the environment, but she's feeling a little lost in that environment. And so you have to look before you see her. So all of my works, I hope they give you something visually interesting to see. And I hope they give you a story to wonder about. Wonder about. I like to use the analogy of a favorite book that you can come back to it over and over again and find something new each time. And if I create works that spark that kind of story, well, then, then I feel like I've done what I hoped when I started out with the piece. So that's what I have for you. And now I'm very happy to introduce you to Al Krieger. Thanks, Bobby, and hello, everybody. I'm Al Krieger, and I live in Lake Villa, Illinois. Uh, and can I have the first slide, please? I'd like to talk about my piece in the show. This is entitled Queer Boy, and it actually is uh, started off as a grade school picture of myself. That's the center figure. Uh, and then turned into a giant collage. And the way, uh, the way I do things is that I scanned, the photograph was scanned into the computer and then manipulated in Photoshop. The whole rest of the center medallion is collaged uh, in uh, Photoshop. So the bananas uh, are stock photos that I downloaded from the internet, the pansies, are all from Victorian Valentines that I also downloaded from the internet. And there's a lot of uh, double meanings in things here. Uh, I like to keep things uh, funny and kind of hidden. <laughs> uh, the bananas are not only a phallic thing, but they're also fruits, which is sometimes a derogatory term for someone who's queer. Uh, uh, I am gay. I didn't come out of the closet until much later, so I was a late bloomer. But I felt that uh, the verbiage here, the queer boy, uh, I was a very strange child. It was oversensitive, cried at the drop of a hat, uh, was embarrassed easily and all that stuff. And I did feel that there was something different about me from everyone else. So again, back to the actual piece, it was collaged in Photoshop. And then I use a spoon flower a web service to transfer it to fabric. This was transferred to Kona cotton. And then uh, once I received the image back, 
uh, I hand embroidered quite a few of the details, especially the eyes. I hand embroidered uh, details on all the flowers and even on some of the bananas. Uh, and I like doing the handwork and I feel it enhances the piece. And then finally, I uh, had it laying around the studio for a while and I have a collection of vintage tablecloths and this lilac one just happened to be out and the piece fell on top of it and it was a perfect marriage. So then I applique by machine the central medallion with the image and all the flowers and then assembled it into a quilt with uh, backing and batting and then this top. Uh, I free motion quilted all around all of the flowers, also myself. It's mostly done in size 50 weight black uh, cotton to bring out the outlines of things. And then uh, free motion quilted mostly in white in the background very densely to make the whole thing pop. And then finally, uh, I didn't, I felt a binding would kind of distract from it. So the edge is a uh, lavender chenille yarn that's couched down around the entire edge. So again, it, uh, it really shows a part of me that I was kind of reluctant to even recognize for a while, but now it's really a great part of me. And many of my pieces are all are self exploratory in this way. So can I have the next slide, please? This was done when I was, this is all bead embroidered. This is my high school yearbook picture. And I looked, I felt like I was about 40 years old and was very tightly wound and was a straight A student, didn't drink, didn't smoke and uh, was uh, just a good boy. So that's how, what I entitled this piece. Uh, it's entirely bead embroidered. The image was scanned into the computer. And then at that time, I used t-shirt transfer paper to iron it onto a vintage pillowcase. And the pillowcase kind of represents uh, hopes and dreams of things. The halo was very interesting. I just took a plate and drew around it. And the pink beads in the halo are 24 karat gold lined. So it looks kind of like it. it it's kind of embarrassing for me, but still that's part of me that I, I wanted to celebrate. Uh, the, the suit is a bead weaving that was tacked down there. That's herringbone stitch in triangle sized beads. So next slide. This is uh, my first art quilt and I was really very pleased uh, to have it accepted into Quilt National 2017. Again, I'm celebrating my awkward teenage years. Uh, this is a picture of me in high school, standing next to the, the family house, which we lived in uh, on the south side of Milwaukee at the time. And uh, I just was so embarrassed by it I, uh, that I had to make it into a piece. So again, it was transferred to fabric, I eliminated some of the details by using applique uh, to cover over some of the distractions. And then again, in Photoshop, I took the word dork and put it all through the siding in the side. And I just really was a dork, but uh, that's just the way it was. Uh, and uh, the, the siding really fascinated me. That's all uh, silk variegated silk ribbon that's hand couched down with single strands of embroidery floss. It took quite a while and almost drove me crazy, but oftentimes in my pieces, I get kind of uh, fixated on a small detail and wanted that to really show, to really work. So next slide. Here's another self-portrait this time. Uh, in the 70s, I was a hippie or kind of a wannabe hippie. And this is from a Polaroid picture that was taken of me in the family kitchen. And uh, I didn't really change the photo that much. Again, it was transferred to fabric. Uh, and uh, the, the navy blue sweater, which was almost my uniform at the time, which I thought made me look thin, but I don't think it really did. Uh, is done in sport weight a wool yarn in chain stitch. And then the flower in the center is from 
uh, vintage French uh, seed packet that I have a collection of. Finally, the hippie verbiage in the bottom is uh, there's a uh, vintage 1970s trim uh, all tacked down over all the letters. And again, this was a, a process I was developing at the time and I use all the time now is that I uh, have the, I do a lot of hand embroidery. The hair is all French knots. Uh, I do a lot of, like putting a lot of hand embroidery and small details in the piece. And then it's layered with backing and batting and quilted, mostly just outlining all the, all the major forms, again, in black thread. So the last slide, last slide. And this is one of my most recent works. I wanted to put a plug in uh, for the Illinois Wisconsin SACWA group. We meet once a month and it's a great group of people. Uh, this will be in the show uh, called Views of the Midwest. And this is a photo I took of Wrigley Field in the early 1970s during the dead of winter, it was very cold. And uh, I just loved all the shapes. And so, uh, I think that's it for me. I do want to encourage people to use their sense of humor. I don't take anything too seriously. And a lot of my work is, is, is that way, but that's just the way it is. Now I'd like to introduce Fuzzy. Hey, hi, Sakwa. Uh, my name is Fuzzy Ma. I'm an artist from Pittsburgh who now lives in Hamilton, Ontario. I specialize in applique portraiture. And I'm often asked how I learned my process and where do I start? Well, after I left school, I went in my basement and I started painting. My work's always been rooted in craft and my processes incorporated textiles, printmaking, and photography. Next. The piece on the left was from my very first series of paintings. I glued fabric to the canvas to create a negative space, which would become the figure. Worried about the archival nature of the glue eventually led me to buying my first sewing machine. Some of these fabrics are still in my stash today. Uh, my paintings have always dealt with my personal life. The image on the right is from a series that marked uh, my engagement to my wife. Uh, the figures being built up from layers of paint in the backside of old windows that represent domesticity and the homestead. Next. These forest tree paintings started uh, from my love of Mexican tree of life sculptures. Uh, they started, I started making this work to kind of send out good vibes while we were trying to have a baby. Uh, they're made from hand cutting large stencils. Uh, some of these pieces reached about eight feet in height. Uh, showed you, I want to show you some of these older paintings because they still influence the way I see and construct my current work. Cutting back layers to expose others, then building on top of that to create depth, structure, and color variations. Um, it's very important for artists to remember that everything we've done in the past influences who we are currently and the work that we're going to be making in the future. Next. One winter while I was working a full-time job starting that family, uh, I went out to my studio to paint and all of my paints were frozen solid. So I needed something to do with my hands. Uh, so I applied this portrait of uh, James Brown on the back of a hoodie. Uh, it was very simple, you know, three colors, obviously, and uh, it was, I guess, striking enough that my friends started asking me to make them something as well. Uh, over the next few years, I probably end up making 40 or 50 of these, uh, de just developing my techniques, tightening up my craftsmanship, adding more colors, layers. That's next. About six years ago, I decided to start hanging my pieces on the wall. This piece is actually a locket that folds in on itself and a painting is on the backside of Frida Kahlo there. So this is Frida and uh, her husband, Diego Rivera. It was, uh, this piece really serves as a transition point for me. Uh, I haven't painted anything since then. And it's also the last time outside of commissions that I've used anyone else's photographs in my work. Next. These are pictures from my Face of Hamilton project. Uh, the one obviously being the one in the Beyond the Mirror show. Uh, four years ago, our family moved to Canada. This gave me the opportunity to start making on a full-time basis, uh, really for the first time. Uh, since my work had always previously been about my personal life, I realized I was gonna run out of subject material pretty quickly. So I came up with this project uh, where I would, 
I meet a new stranger in my town and start asking them questions about my new city. Next. I then quilt their uh, portrait. Uh, after I'd finish it, I would meet up with them to show it to them and then uh, ask them to send me the next person I should know in town. So I'd set up a you know a lunch date with them, the new participant, take a bunch of photos while I got to know them, chatted. Um, this work was really like a response to the disposable nature of social media. I intended on slowing down this process, hand working these pictures. You know, they often live in the cloud and are swiped away with the finger. Combining the tradition of painted portraits as well as quilts that both become family heirlooms passed down to generations. Next. I often tell people that my work is made up of thrift store clothes and patience. Um, I feel that the, my patience and care for details, why few people are starting to notice my work. Uh, for example, if you look closely at some of these teeth, there might be eight to 10 layers of fabric just to uh, achieve the proper tone of shadow. Next. My current body of work continues to focus on personal identity and diversity, depicting people of various ages, races, and genders. I capture people in action, in personal settings, doing things they love to do. This work is a response to our current media landscape, which is jarring and anxiety-inducing. As an American living in Canada, I've been feeling helpless watching each news cycle. Next. I feel sad, angry, frustrated, and ineffective. I know the stories of school shootings, corporate greed, decaying environment, and corrupt politicians won't stop anytime soon. As a result, I can only focus on localized and momentary happiness. This series portrays people doing simple things that bring them bliss, whether it be gardening, biking, yoga, or playing with a pet. More than ever, I need to see people enjoying life's small moments. Next. Another side project I have in the works is my Kill Your Darling series. Uh, William Faulkner coined that term. It refers to killing off major characters to further the good of a novel or an idea. These pieces are all made up of my Faces of Hamilton project. Uh, I knew when I was making that work that I was gonna repurpose it somehow. Um, I'm happy with what's going on right now with this work, but truly it's just a stepping stone uh, to what I have planned in the future. So stay tuned. Thank you very much. And up next is the great Katherine Wilson. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. I want to thank the SACWA staff, which is an exceptional staff doing exceptional work for SACWA members. Let's begin our talk by beginning with my quilt, False Advertising. Identity is chosen and imposed. False advertising addresses uh, the accepted norm of the white beauty standard. We, surrounded, we are surrounded with images and videos, um, advertisements, suggesting what beauty looks like. If you're young and impressionable, the images and if the images you see do not look like you, then that can lead to low self-esteem and other issues. This is particularly true for young girls of color. Uh, today, the images we see are much more diverse than when I was coming up because there were none. And so uh, to prevent me from thinking negatively about myself, my mother taught me that there were three versions of me. There was the me as I saw myself, there was the me as other people saw me, and neither of those were totally correct, and there was the real me the authentic me, the natural me. And I thought about my mother's uh, saying when this call um, for Beyond the Mirror came up and I decided to make a quilt that depicted what she told me and how I was raised uh, to view myself. So here you have um, a young lady who is about to go on a night on the town. And she, it, on the picture, you see how she naturally looks. In the mirror, you see how she sees herself. 
And then as she appears with the false hair, the false eyelashes, you know, the all the colors in her face, she looks actually clownish. And it, it, it addresses how young people go through too many changes to transform themselves to be considered attractive or to draw attention. With this quilt, I use both natural and synthetic materials. I created what I call the canvas, which is the background. And then the rest is um, primarily uh, applique, fused applique, painted and embellished. Next. This quilt, Nick and Aaron, uh, is a gift, was a gift for my nephew, Nick, uh, to celebrate his first Father's Day with his son, Aaron. Now, this was the first time I had actually done a pictorial quilt. Uh, and Nick had this particular photograph as a screensaver, and I asked him to send it to me uh, without revealing what I was going to do with it. And I made this quilt. And this quilt is, as, as indicated, 11 by 14, and it is framed in his office. Uh, with this quilt, it was just layered, fused applique um, in blue cottons. Next. In this quilt, Mobro, <laughs> I was thinking about economic hardships in the inner city. Uh, this young man has his hands up. He, he's resigned to having less resources and paying higher prices for everything. The cash flowing out of his pocket um, was symbolic of the cash economy that he lives in. Credit really doesn't exist in the inner city. And if it does, it's at such a premium cost that is really not worth it. Uh, when you more mo broke, you in a survival mode and you may do with uh, what you have and what you know. Some interesting information about this particular quilt that I'd like to share. Uh, mo broke exhibited on the West Coast in a gallery and it was my first uh, quilt to earn sizable prize money. Um, it also exhibited on the East Coast in a federal courtroom, uh, I should say courthouse, uh, and I was asked to remove it. Uh, it seemed the image of the young man made people uncomfortable. And I found that kind of ironic because a courthouse is usually where a young man like this is prosecuted, sentenced uh, to jail time. Um, but it just shows how different audiences can look at the same piece of work and walk away with different perceptions. For this quilt, I used um, recycled clothing that I bought at a thrift store that's in an inner city neighborhood. Next. In 2014, the Boston Herald newspaper had a cartoon where President Obama was brushing his teeth in the White House uh, bathroom. And he was asked by a white intruder sitting in the bathtub if he had tried the new watermelon flavored um, toothpaste. Now, of course, this created a big buzz and the creator of the cartoon claimed a race was the first thing on his mind uh, and that he did, he loved watermelon. This was, he wasn't thinking of race at all, but when you look at the cartoon, it didn't make sense left, unless racism was involved in some way. Uh, so I found it both um, sad and offensive that, you know, here we are in the 21st century and this depiction of black people in watermelon had been around for over a hundred years. Um, so I created this quilt. Uh, and what I did was I, cre I, I uh, researched the subject, uh, the, the black people with the watermelon and, and what, what was the history behind that? And so as you see, there's blocks going around the border 
um, of the quilt. And those blocks talk about that history for reconstruction up until the time of Obama's presidency. And it also talks about the nutritional benefits of watermelon. And I purposely put these two beautiful black children eating this huge piece of nutritional fruit uh, in, in this quilt to counter the images that have, have historically uh, been done regarding blacks and watermelon. Um, I also use traditional, if you can see what looks like, it could be arguably said as a traditional quilt, but I did that intentionally because um, racism seems unfortunately to be traditional and it doesn't seem to want uh, to go away. And so I thought it was important to use uh, a traditional technique. Um, my message is clear. Racism is not funny, it never has been. And so we need to try to get over it. Next. Uh, Prayer war Warriors is currently a quilt that's in so a Sakwa regional uh, exhibit entitled Working with the Mute. Uh, my entire life, uh, I've had Black women, elders, uh, known and unknown, uh, pray for me. They were family friends, uh, elders, women in the church. Uh, and, and, and a lot of times, because of the circumstances of their life, they would take great joy and pleasure in seeing young, their young people succeed in, 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 in any way. And so um, prayer was a, a major part of that. And they would pray for children in the church for their success, uh, for, um, uh, for their education, for all types of things, to protect them from brutality, uh, a lot of things. And it, 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 it just, this quilt um, was my way of saying thank you uh, to the women who had prayed for me. Um, You'll see the raw the, the various sections, the sky, the ground, the grass. Uh, it, uh, it's made with scraps, um, cut with a rotary cutter uh, in different shapes, etc., and then um, placed on the quilt. Now I did it this way because um, sometimes. Black life can be raw, it can be edgy, it can be scrappy. And I thought, I thought that would be uh, a, a good technique to use to depict uh, what these women were praying about. As you can see, their backs are faced uh, to the audience or the viewer because in many ways they turn their backs on the problems of the world and they look forward toward their faith. And, and through prayer to bring um, relief and to bring blessings. So like them, I turn my back on artistic constraints sometime and, and uh, I communicate what is true to me. Uh, next, please. Raining Corona is another applique quilt, uh, which is a play on words. Uh, I think we could all agree that uh, corona, the coronavirus has rained this year and it continues to be the focus of attention. Um, the mask under the umbrella symbolizes protection from the raining virus that you see in those uh, silver uh, depictions of the virus. Uh, this quilt was in re response to a reader's challenge in Quilting Arts Magazine, and it's in the current issue. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope you enjoyed my work. Thanks, Catherine. Um, Fuzzy, Al, Bobby, can you turn your videos and audios back on? 
because boy, do we have a lot of questions for everybody. Uh, Fuzzy, we're still looking for your video. Yeah, it says that uh, you stopped it, so it won't. Oh, OK, open. Lucy, can you fix that? Got there it. we go. Thank you. Wonderful. Oh, my goodness. It was so fascinating to see four such very different approaches to art. Um, somebody, Nelda Workington, who was a SACWA board member, once said to me that she thought that all art is autobiographical and that the artist is putting themselves into the art that they're making. And so if you know about the artist and you look at the art, whether or not it's actually a portrait of yourself, like so much of Al's work is, it nonetheless tells the viewer things about the artist's life. And this um, artist what, was only doing abstract work. So you had to have a lot of interpretation to see how it was autobiographical, but it was. Um, and this exhibition, Beyond the Mirror, is all about looking at how art is portraits of people and what's going on in their lives. All right, the questions. So for Bobby, um, there were a lot of questions about um, process. Uh, so they want to know what kind of photo transfer process you do, especially how do you do that onto sheer fabrics, and how do you join those sections working on such, at a machine with such a small throat? A photo transfer first. Okay. Uh, I, I don't photo transfer onto sheer. I photo transfer onto muslin. I use gel medium and start with a laser color copy and pull the image off of the laser color copy with the gel medium. Okay. Uh, and then you carefully peel off the paper. It's mm -hmm. quite tedious, but it, I think it makes a really strong pop on the photo. Yep. Uh, sheer, I use in other ways, but I don't transfer on that. And how I construct on the small machine, I just work in parts. I have to think ahead of time how I'm going to sew things together and try to do all of the quilting before I'm at a point of no return. So I'm not trying to do that in the middle of a great big piece. Great. I also have some questions about themes, but let's do all these technique ones, because since so many of our audience members are makers themselves, they always want to know about technique. So um, Al, the question for you is, how big is your stash of vintage textiles? <laughs> I, I've been collecting quite a while. And uh, so I have, I'd have maybe about 10 to 15 vintage tablecloths. They're usually from the 40s and 50s. And then uh, at flea markets and stuff like that, I have some vintage quilt tops, which will eventually show up uh, in pieces. Uh, and I just, uh, I go to Goodwill and buy old stuff too, especially old shirts and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's fairly large. I'm in the process now of reorganizing my studio and it's just a complete disaster right now. But <laughs> I, I, you know, like I alluded to with the, the Queer Boy piece is that I was working with that applique piece for a while before it occurred to me that that tablecloth would make a perfect frame. And it just mm -hmm. so happened that the tablecloth was lying out and I placed this on top, it was on top of a chair next to my desk. And uh, I found the same thing when I was doing a lot of bead embroidery. Uh, I, I felt the need to clean everything up and have everything in nice little rows and everything, but it never worked out that way and things fell over. And then uh, I felt that through that chaos, some really interesting combinations showed up that I never would have thought of before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think serendipity chaos plays a part in everybody's um, art lives. Uh, Fuzzy, they want to know, how are your pieces mounted? Um, so the, the pieces of Hamilton, like the, you know, more traditional rectangular pieces are stretched over top of frames. Like coming from a painting background, that's kind of what made sense for me. And particularly when I hung this show, I wanted to hung salon style in the gallery. So it became its own quilt in a way. Uh, so that was going to be the easiest way to achieve that. The new work is all sewn on the back of industrial felt. Okay. Uh, so it gives a little more substance to the back of it. 
Um, and then I have, I'll, I sew in Velcro straps to the back of it. And then those just get uh, Velcro to the wall, like on like planks that just get screwed in. Mm -hmm. So they just float, there's no background to it. And uh, they just become, you know, they're able to cast their own shadow and become your, you, you know, enter this only this space like of, you know, these people doing it. It's a little voyeuristic in a way. But. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you really feel like you're there with them in that action. Yeah. And they're all like eight, eight feet high and, you know, oh, okay. I so them, and large. I have that little tiny throat too. It's, I, I feel for you, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> um, Catherine, um, somebody wanted to know, um, in Prayer Warriors, the background is a collage of many, many different kinds of fabrics. How did you create that? Well, um, that's an interesting question. I just took the colors that I wanted, like as you can see, there's the sky, the ground, etc. And I took different batiks um, and solid fabrics in those colors and put them on a mat and just went to work with my cutter. I mean, just different shapes and um, no design, no pattern, just cutting pieces. And I uh, took uh, fabric layered with um, misty fuse, and I just would lay the uh, fabric pieces uh, on the respective areas, iron it down, do the quilting. Mm -hmm. While I'm talking to you, um, yeah. I want to talk, ask you a little bit more about Mo Broke. Yes. So um, about the fact that um, it was asked that you were asked to remove it from the exhibition and how did that make you feel? And do you think that the fact that you were using real clothing, so it was had to be fairly life size, really changed the impact that it had on viewers? Well, it really wasn't um, life size. I mean, what you see in terms of the jeans and the hoodie, I actually, um, baby clothing. So, okay. so, so it's, it's a very small quilt, but as I said, everything that's in that quilt was purchased at a thrift store. So I went and I found some baby jeans. Uh, there is a companion piece to Mo, Mo Broke that isn't finished and it's called Broke. And it's his brother, but he has a New York City background and he has, he's going to have credit cards flying out of his head. Well, he's broke too, but he's broke in a very different way. And I actually found a little uh, Calvin Klein, believe it or not, a uh, little boy suit that he will be in with the tie, etc. cetera. So, uh, so yeah, I get my materials from, from many different places. Uh, in false advertising, the New York skyline actually came um, from a, I believe it was a, um, uh, it was some type of piece. It was a shower curtain that that <laughs> that had the New York skyline. And I just used the shower curtain. I mean, I just see things, and I said, "Whoa, I need to keep that, or that's, I may have future use for that." So I find things all over the place. Yeah. No, I, I think all four of you seem to be. Um, collectors of unusual materials and e even if you don't know how you're going to use them. Fuzzy, I assume, because you said that you also are using thrift store clothing, that you might, are you looking, going to a thrift store when you have a specific piece in mind or do you have a stash now? I do have a crazy stash, but you know, like I'm, I'm always constantly buying more and more things. Um, but, you know, for several reasons, like, you know, in Canada, like I saw a stat, the average Canadian throws away 87 pounds of clothing every day, every year. And I imagine, you know, it might be more in the States, but uh, so yeah, trying to keep things out, out, out of the landfills, but also, you know, like each, you know, blouse is, you know, a color of paint for a, for a painter. So I'm not reliant on the same patterns over and over. Like once, it, once I cut up that dress, it's done and I, you know, I can't go back to it. So it keeps, keeps my palette fresh, but and then it also, like, I feel like they have, like, buying the thrift store clothes, like, they've been washed hundreds of times, and, you know, they, they've lived their life before, and I find, like, just like the people that I'm trying to portray, like, 
it's no one's super fresh and shiny. Um, I don't know, outside of LA maybe. But. <laughs> Only if they've had work done recently. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bobby, tell us a little bit more about your use of chairs, trees, and houses, and what they mean for you, and how that works into the symbols that you use in your work. The subject matter of the young girl, as I've explored it, what seemed important to me was to put her in a physical space, not just to depict a girl alone. And so at the same time as I was working on the series of the girl, I worked on a series about home. And in the home series, I had a lot of physical childlike renderings of houses. So I could put the girl in a house or outside a house or next to a house. So that's how that came in. Um, the ladder back chair is just a, a chair that was in my best friend's house when I was young. I always loved them and they speak to me of memory. And I had some great ladder back chairs and photographed them. And that's where that came from. Mm -hmm. And the trees tie things together. Trees are kind of the perfect symbol there. I mean, first off, visually, they can tie together different sections. They speak to growth. If you have a whole lot of trees, now you've created a scary fairy tale forest. So they just have a, a lot of meaning. And I find when I add them, they always seem to be just the right thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there is a follow-up question um, that asked that um, you, when you talked about your work, uh, you seem to be indicating that some of it was a way of working out things that you were dealing with emotionally, personally, whatever. Do you find that doing this kind of art is therapeutic on a psychological level. Yes. All right. <laughs> um, yes, and I think it's more um, looking back and remembering, for example, the loneliness of a child. I, I am not a lonely child now. I'm at a good place in my life, but I remember it as a very important experience. And I wouldn't be the person I am now if I hadn't gone through that. And I want to give voice to those experiences because I think they're very important. So it's not so much struggles I am currently working out as memory of stages that I've been through and wanting to give voice because it's so important. They're how I got here. Mm -hmm. And Al, uh, that's an obvious segue to your work um, because one, several of the comments were um, how brave everybody thinks you are to be able to put those photos that you stated were embarrassing out there in public as a way to exercise them? I mean, how do you see your use of those early photos? Well, you know, uh, I didn't mention it in my talk, but one of the things that influenced me was my oldest sister who is gone now, but she gave me for my birthday a little tiny album that was maybe three by five of all these really embarrassing pictures of me throughout all the years, including baby pictures, and then the awkward teenage years and everything. And I thought it was such a gift. One of the things my family has always done is go enjoying and pulling out the, the photo albums and just laughing and laughing at what we looked like, the hairdos, the clothes, uh, the situations we were in. And uh, I kind of never got over that. It's just, uh, I think we need to celebrate all of those things, you know, because I like to, uh, as an adult, I'd like to think of myself as this very sophisticated person, but there's really, you know, and my sister mentioned it to me once. I said, you know, I've got the, these pictures. And she said, you know, you were all those things. You were a dork, uh, uh, you're a uh, you're gay, you're uh, all of that other stuff. And, you know, I, I grew up to be a scientist and lived in the scientific world for all my adult working life, but it just what you know, it was all kind of mixed up in there. So I know people think I'm brave. I just think, you know, I encourage people to just look at that stuff and laugh and maybe make art out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I think that um, that is the common theme among the, the four artists work is that you're looking at life, whether it's your life or the life of your neighbors or the life of your community and using it as a way to generate wonderful art. I wanna thank you all so much 
for sharing your art, sharing your stories um, to our audience. If you will just hang in there, we're going to show the whole exhibition again so you can see how these four pieces fit in to the entire exhibition called Beyond the Mirror. Thank you so much for joining us today.